It's early evening in September 2017. Three police cars pull up outside a house in Melbourne's northern suburbs. The disability pensioner inside the house is mentally ill and very distressed. He's been withdrawing from the pain medication prescribed after back surgery. John's medical carers have called police, worried at his deteriorating state. Police dispatch notes warn John may confront them and try to provoke them into shooting him. He also has a minor assault on his record from 10 years ago. But from behind his locked screen door, he repeatedly pleads with them to leave him alone. The police notes state that when John opened the door, he came at them with two raised fists. But the video appears to show him fending off an officer coming at him with capsicum spray. John has asked not to be fully identified. Do you remember being hit? Not really, no. I felt everything the next day, but I was more from the withdrawal and then the incident that just, of oh my, uh, I went into like shock, basically. That's the word, shock. While police pin him down, one strikes John's calf with a baton. He is punched and his face is again sprayed with capsicum at close range. You like that? Oh, you like that? It smells good, doesn't it? Get your fucking hands behind your fucking back. Oh, my back! He had committed no crime, they were here for a welfare check and uh, for him to be treated in that way is humiliating and, and at the end of the day quite degrading um, uh, for anyone, let alone someone who has mental health issues and really had committed no crime. No one. No one. An officer gets a hose to wash the pepper spray off John's face, aiming a jet of water at his eyes. I thought I was going to die. I really literally thought I was going to drown. Like, I don't know, it's all girdling. Like, you can feel the mace and the water together in your lungs. It's just, it's a weird feeling. It's hard to explain. Yeah, happy, yeah, happy. An officer appears to direct his colleague to spray John a third time. So he can capture it on his mobile phone camera. It was like, like a game for them, they wanted to get their rocks off, you know. I don't know, I really don't know why, you know. John's lawyer says that what is unusual about his treatment here in his front yard is not that it occurred. It's that it was captured on CCTV, a system John installed after he was burgled. John's lawyer also says that it's telling that some of what you see in the vision was never recorded in the police reports of the incident. Not one of these officers raised any concerns about what happened in the post-incident reports. What John's case highlights though uh, is that these things do occur and he obviously has the evidence to be able to back it up. You've told John not to bother interacting with the police complaints system. Why is that? Well, the police complaint system has an extraordinarily low substantiation rate. Uh, I think it's something like 9% substantiation rate was found in an IBAC audit. Uh, so I just don't think um, for John that really th th there's going to be any meaningful change if he were to complain to the police directly. Um, I, I would be concerned about uh, the investigation, about him giving a statement, about the effect on him, and then ultimately my suspicion would be that they would find it to be unsubstantiated and that would just cause him further distress. Victoria's police complaint system is in crisis. The state's independent broad-based anti-corruption commission or IBAC 
has made multiple criticisms, from the low number of complaints that are upheld to the force's failure to weed out repeat offenders. Last week, it produced another report, criticising the way police handle internal investigations of serious incidents, including that it fails to consider relevant evidence and gives too much weight to police testimony over independent witnesses. A lot of the time people don't want to complain directly to the police because they're worried about the inherent conflict um, in complaining to police and police investigating their own. Uh, but then the problem is they complain to IBAC and IBAC refers over 90% of those back to the police to complain. There's conflict of interest everywhere. It's a question of how you manage the conflict of interest. Former Judge Michael Strong was the head of Victoria's Office of Police Integrity until its functions were absorbed into the IBAC. The only way you could remove all potential conflict of interest is to have every complaint against police investigated by an independent agency. I would like to see more of the more serious complaints against police independently investigated, but that's a resourcing issue. In the heat of confronting a violent criminal, the line between reasonable and excessive force can be difficult to define. This 23-year-old is trying to hold up a pharmacy in Melbourne's north with a pair of scissors. He's having a psychotic episode and has already violently assaulted four people outside. When bystanders try to take him down, one receives a wound to his head. Finally, police arrive, and this is where lawyers say police cross the line. He no longer has the scissors he's been using as a weapon. He's face down on the floor and is punched repeatedly as police try to put him in handcuffs. He's kicked to the head. Then the officer pulls out his baton and hammers it down. More police arrive and he is handcuffed, but then the officer stomps on his back. Minutes later, he kicks out at the officer and is thrown to the ground. He later pleaded guilty to armed robbery and assault and was last year jailed for two years and nine months. His lawyer, Natasha Wallen, says a complaint of excessive force was lodged with Victoria Police's Professional Standards Command. He suffered significant facial injuries. Uh, most of his teeth were snapped. Uh, he's got ongoing back issues. He was taken to hospital directly after the incident because he wasn't deemed to be fit enough to be in police custody. The complaint was dismissed. At the time, the officer in charge of professional standards was Assistant Commissioner Brett Gurren, who quit the force in disgrace in February after it was revealed he'd used a fake identity to post violent and racist rants online. Many may find it difficult to have much sympathy for a violent offender who assaulted members of the public and threatened shop staff. But the integrity of the criminal justice system relies on the courts and not the cops being responsible for punishing offenders. Meanwhile, those who've been through the police complaint system alleging brutality say it is failing. And the only way to hold police to account is to launch an expensive civil action. Jesse Scarlett Rhodes sued police after receiving these injuries during an arrest after a night out with friends in Sunbury. The arrest happened after her husband, who was on medication, started vomiting in a laneway outside this pub. She was tending to him when they were approached by four police officers who shone a light in her face and demanded ID. She swore at them. And then um, the next thing I knew, I was violently forced down to the ground. I had a fracture on the top of my nose. Um, I had a concussion. I had grazing and um, bruising. So my eyebrow and my cheekbone were, um, were cut open. Jessie lodged a complaint with police but got nowhere. Instead, she was charged with assault and presented with a choice. Accept a criminal diversion and avoid a conviction or fight it and risk having a criminal record. Jessie accepted the diversion 
but then decided to launch her own action, a civil case. It was really tough. It's a very long process, very stressful. I felt I had no other option at that stage. I couldn't walk away because I felt like, um, I just felt like my innocence and had it had all been taken away from me on that night and my rights. She won, a county court judge finding she'd been improperly arrested, had been thrown head first into a police van, had her rights trampled and been subject to disgraceful treatment at the hands of police. She was awarded $86,000 in compensation. It's not right and it needs to be changed. The complaint situation with how complaints are handled, that needs to be changed. Assistant Commissioner Luke Cornelius is now in charge of professional standards. He says since we made police aware of the CCTV, both incidents have been referred to the IBAC. The conduct displayed on the CCTV demanded examination and explanation. The members involved clearly needed to be called to account for their conduct. It's just, it's, it's wrong, you know, what, because you've got a badge and a gun, you, you can be judge and jury, whatever you want to call it, you know, it, it's wrong. These guys, they've got everything on them to restrain a person, there's no need for that. You know, all they had to do was um, let me be, 